Well, hey there, Stonegate. How are y'all this morning? Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for being here. My name is Jeremy Swanson. Um, I'm a servant leader. I actually serve uh, leading worship in our Odessa campus most weekends, which is why I'm not probably familiar to y'all. Uh, but I'm really glad to be here with y'all this morning uh, to sing to make much of our King Jesus. And so uh, I just want to invite you to, to stand and welcome again. Welcome to our people watching on Facebook Live and just enjoy you. Uh, invite you to sing with us. Thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above. Praise a mountain fixed upon it, Mount of Irene.
God from God, life from life. We believe in one Jesus Christ, breaking through the darkest of nights to say, you alone can save. Where there is no way 
Let's pray together this morning, church. Oh, God, I'm so grateful for this morning. God, for a time and a place to gather together as the body of Jesus Christ and to worship and celebrate our great King and Savior. His name is Jesus. It's Him that we preach and proclaim this morning as we worship God out of response for all that you are and all that you've done for us. By sending your son Jesus to live a perfect life and to die on a cross and to rise from the grave, to conquer over death, to rob the grave of its power over us and to bring us to life. God, we celebrate you this morning, Jesus. And we make much of you for all you are and all that you've done. And God, I pray as we continue to worship now through giving a tithe and an offering, that we would worship out of just a response of gratitude and thankfulness God, because we recognize that our supply is from you. Everything we have is yours, Jesus. So we give out of that. Pray that that would be just from a grateful and a cheerful and a thankful heart. And pray that we would continue to worship as we listen to your word be preached. Give us hearts and ears, God, just to receive that truth. That it take root in us and produce a fruit of righteousness, faithfulness, and obedience, God. Because you're good and you can be trusted. We love you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, y'all can have a seat. Good morning, church. Buenos dias. We're so happy that you decided to join us in worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. My name is Cheyenne Solis, and about three months ago, my family and I, we just moved to the Permian Basin. And we had a great introduction to those dust storms that are here in West Texas. I have a few things that I want to share before Patrick comes and shares the gospel with you. Um, If it's your first time visiting with us, we have what we call the Start Here card. If you have a few seconds, please fill it out and drop it off in the offering. Also, we have what we call the What's Next card. This is a great place where you can connect and get to know what's happening here in Stonegate, whether it's with missions, whether it's small groups or youth and so forth. Please take time to read that and, and also connect with us. Also, um, we have a couple of weeks left for, uh, to sign up your students for camp. Please do that online as well. If you are a servant leader that has signed up, we will be having a training next week on the 21st here in Millen at 10 a.m. Every servant leader has to do one of these trainings. And on April 27th, we're going to have our Women's Renew Conference taking place here in Millen. So everybody that, that went to Odessa, please come back here to Millen. We have a great time of praise and worship with Cindy Payton sharing a message. Also, with Stonegate, we uh, partner with church planners starting new churches with missionaries that are abroad, whether it's locally, nationally, or abroad, overseas. And we're looking to form teams to go and serve This summer, we have Fiji, we have Toronto, we have San Francisco, and we have Nicaragua. We're still looking to form teams. So please come and check us out at the Mission Kiosk. Give us a call or just uh, talk to one of us. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thanks, Cheyenne. I'm laughing with Cheyenne and his family because that whole thing, I, I was actually thinking about it yesterday when I was cleaning up my yard after our beautiful weather here. And um, I was thinking about all the people who have moved here, you know, over the last year. And I hope this doesn't come across negatively, but I, literally my thought process was, man, because we do this thing called New to Midland where women can go to th- to figure out what to do with this place their husbands have drugged them to in Odessa and Midland. And I'm just thinking about all those wives just thinking, are you kidding me? Are you really kidding me? And, um, but then, you know, all of us who have lived here for a long time are like, oh, but the sunsets are beautiful. So <laughs> it's just crazy. So good morning to all of you and to Odessa and to our North Campus. And uh, it is great to be here with you. Just remember camp, we're already at record numbers as far as kids signing up. Over 900 kids have signed up for youth camp. We're already full at kids, at kids camp. Have a waiting list for that. And, and God's doing exciting things. Uh, with our camp. So I encourage you to take your Bibles and be ready in Luke chapter 6, whether you have, um, you're going to use your phone or iPad or a hard copy of the scriptures, Luke chapter 6. So most of you know, if you're a visitor with us, this might be something to catch you up on. 
we're doing this study together called Experiencing God. It's a fairly old study, a couple decades old, uh, written by Henry Blackaby, Dr. Henry Blackaby, and we did it in the early days of our, of our church, and uh, we just thought it'd be a nice journey for us together, 12, 12 weeks long, and uh, our small groups are doing those, the study together, and many people are pursuing it individually in the marketplace. Um, but we're going to take a little different turn here this morning, and I've got to address this squirrel that's going through my head. I was laughing backstage before I came out here because uh, we were joking about, well, we weren't joking, we were talking about the weather, and, 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 um, and when we started building what is now, th- what is this barn, what we call an auditorium, you know, we're doing all the excavation work, and I got a call, I mean, you know, I've been here two and a half years, maybe three years, we're starting to build this thing, and a guy calls me and says, hey, He's mad at me, you know, I'm pretty used to that now, but he, he says, what are you going to do about your dust? And I go, excuse me? He goes, what are you going to do about your dust? It's blowing everywhere because you're building that building. And I go, I, I'm not going to do anything about it. Like, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, you I, I can't do anything. I'll talk to Jesus, but I can't do anything about the dust. And then I asked him, I go, where are you from? We just moved here from Ohio. And I go, oh, sir, let me just tell you, you need to move back. So I, I didn't even invite him to church. But anyways, missed that experience of God moment. So uh, that's before we started that phrase, there's no neutral moments. So let me tell you why we're changing things up. So, so week 10, which is what you, you possibly could be in this coming week. Some of you might be a little behind or ahead, doesn't matter. But in the teaching schedule, we're supposed to address chapter 10. And it's about experiencing God in the church. Okay, and what's God doing in your church? So Monday night, we have an elder meeting. And about every other Monday night, we have elder meetings. And, um, and one of the things we do is what we tell you what we're going to do. We pray for the body and pray over these requests. They're on the stages here and in Odessa and everywhere else. So we're in here in the auditorium, and, and we gather them up, and we kind of scatter throughout the auditorium. Uh, you know, there's 11 of us, 12 of us. And, and we just take a handful. Some guys stay up here at the stage. I usually sweep up a handful and take them to a corner somewhere and journal some things, and we pray over those things. So as an elder body, we're, we're doing two things uh, before we go into our meeting time. We're, we're praying over these, and, and the task that our uh, vice chairman of the elders has asked us to consider, because our chairman was out of town, he said, I want you guys to be thinking two things tonight. I want you to be thinking, one, what seem to be the common themes running through the prayer requests that are on the stages in all of our venues. So we're thinking about that. And me, in my sort of sequential mindset, I take the prayer requests and literally categorize what they are and then count them and all. I'm not even praying. I'm, I'm doing a spreadsheet on, you know, uh, prayer. And then the second thing was, what is the big thing God wants us to do at church? What's the next big thing, the next experience in God thing? So you get our assignment. And we're doing this for 30, 45 minutes in prayer. And then we, we pack it up and go over to start the meeting. And part of the, the second part of the meeting, or the first part of that part, was we were going to ask each of us what we saw and what we're thinking. So we, we start making lists of things we're seeing. And really, they, the, the requests fall into pretty common categories, really three or four categories and a lot of them are just relationship issues, a lot of marriage issues, a lot of addiction issues, you just, and, and really just almost every one of them fall in one of those categories, a wayward child, medical issues. Anyways, we're, we're looking at all those, just trying to see what God's doing. You know, the Bible says elders are supposed to know well the condition of the flock. So that's what they're doing, is trying to figure out what the condition of the flock is. So we're getting that, and we're, we're praying over that, and then we go to the second question. What is God doing? talking about all of our venues and Odessa and here, and what's the next big thing? Well, it kind of stopped us, and, um, and one of our elders said, you know, I'm not so sure that our church has lost sight of what big things are that God does, and let me explain. There aren't many churches, literally in the, I'll say the country, but I literally mean the world, there aren't many that have grown used to seeing anywhere from 25 to 35 people baptized every month because of giving their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I talk to churches that will ask me, how many people did you see come to Jesus last month? And I'll say, mm, and we baptized 35 in our last baptism service or whatever. And they'll go, we haven't baptized 35 in 10 years or five or a year. We lose sight of that. We've lost sight of the fact that for some churches, just to build a building puts them in 10 years of debt, 15 years of debt, 20 years of debt. We've built nearly $30 million worth of buildings and never carried anything past three years. I mean, like literally, 
rarely even one year after completion is it not been paid for. And only on the first one did we do the capital campaign, you know, that had, remember the, you guys don't remember, remember fundraising campaigns where you have the thermometer on the wall, you, you know what I'm talking about, the guilt monitor, and, and see how, and we haven't done mailers, you know, we haven't done commitment cards, give your firstborn, we'll cash them in, and whatever it is, we haven't done that. So here we are, we've, we bought a bar, turned it into a church, seven million, done, what's next? We've lost sight of that. When there are churches that are in bankruptcy because of, long-term debt, capital campaigns, whatever it is. Um, we've lost sight of the fact that a big thing is people just kind of show up in Midland and they're here, and we don't do direct mailers hardly ever. We've done some in Odessa. You know, we don't do a television show live from Stonegate. It's Patrick Payton. Or, you know, that has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Here's Patrick. So anyways, um, we don't do any of that. I mean, it's just crazy. We've lost sight of that. We, we, uh, well, I'm in Houston a um, week or so ago and just uh, talking to some business leaders and uh, one of the business leaders says to me, now tell me about camp, this camp thing you do. And I said, I, you know, we take, um, when you count all the numbers, we take about 2,000 people to camp. He goes, what? And this is a cat that's been, that sounds like I'm in the 60s. This is a gentleman who's been in the church world longer than I've been alive. And he's a business person. Um, and so he goes, What? And, you know, we've been together a couple hours already in the morning. He sits back in his chair, literally almost starts crying. What? He said, tell me that again. I said, yeah, we'll mobilize about 2,000 people. We'll spend anywhere between $500,000 and a million dollars. I'm just saying it like it's yesterday. Yeah, we'll take 30, 30 buses to camp and blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, it's just what we do. He's like, do you, do you understand what God's doing? So in the elder meeting, we're, we're talking about how we've just kind of lost sight of big things. Then, this is what nails us, just sort of like a lightning bolt from Jesus kind of moment. I wonder if for our church body, the danger now in this study is for them to start thinking more about the next big thing God wants to do at Stonegate rather than the one thing that keeps kicking your spiritual tail every single day. You see, all over this stage and all over the Odessa stage and north, you've laid down requests, and many of you have not laid them down, and it's stuff you've been working through your whole life, or the last five years, or the last six months. And the truth is, you pray about it, and you pray about it, and you pray about it, and you're hoping this exciting moment might be the moment where it changes. And the truth is, It'd be easier for you to believe in God to do something big in the church than it would be for you to really believe he's going to do something in that thing you've laid on the stage, literally and figuratively. I'll give you another example. It's sort of like um, some of you who have kids, you're so discouraged that you maybe didn't become all you thought you could in baseball or softball or soccer or volleyball or school. And so now you live vicariously through your kids, pressuring them and ruining them because you're hoping they become what you never became. We use a phrase called living vicariously through your children. And quite frankly, many people live their spiritual life vicariously through the church. So what we want to stop dead in its tracks is this idea that you can just quickly jump to what God's going to do at Stonegate and miss what he's trying to do in your life. You've been alive for a while. Some of you longer than I've been alive. We've been in church much of our lives. I can remember going to revival service after revival service in the church I grew up in. I can remember going to crusade after crusade. Raise your hands if you've been to a revival service or a crusade. That's like most everybody. And you remember the whole thing in revivals and crusades. The, here's the catchphrase. If there's any shadow of a doubt that if you died tonight, you'd spend eternity in heaven or hell, you need to get right down here to the front and get saved. Well, it, it's like when they said shadow of a doubt, you're like, I, is that a shadow? <laughs> and so you hurry up and go get resaved. And, and which, is, which is why even at youth camp, we try to take as much emotion out of the services as we can. Because this is what kids do as well. 
And, and so what happens in, in churches and in communities is you have revival services, brand new churches, excitement, and, and then the community watches, and the next thing you know, after all the decisions and after all the dancing in aisles and drinking poison and holding snakes and everybody's done all this kind of stuff, everything goes back to normal after about a month on a good one. And nobody's different, and the workplace isn't any different, and the families are still disintegrating, and all things remain the same. I, this is the example I thought about on my commute here to work. It's a three-mile commute. And so I was thinking on, on the way here, I thought, oh, you know, I the story I remember. And I know we live in like the barbecue capital of the world. And some of you people have like rigs you put on the back of your truck that cost more than my house. But this is a small example. Do you remember back in the day when you had to use Kingsford charcoal briquettes? You remember that? I mean, now you have to like, like, like designer briquettes or whatever. So, and you'd go get those things, get the black all over your fingers, you know what I'm talking about? But before someone taught you how to do this, which when I was a young married guy, I'd never even done this. I, we always had a gas grill, you know, where you just like, and turn it on and, you know, poof. And so I'm going to do, I'm going to be like, charcoal guy. And, and I don't know any different. I'm not reading any instructions. You're not supposed to. You're men. So I, I pour the bag in there. And what's the most exciting part of starting a charcoal fire? Lighter fluid, baby. And so I've got the lighter fluid. And, and all I know to do is, you know, lighter fluid, lighter fire. So I cover, the, you know what's, where the story's going. I cover it up and I drop a match on there and poof. I mean, I'm like, fire! And, and turn around to go inside to get the burgers and come outside and what's happened? It's out. It, it, nothing, nothing's happening. So I go, well, not enough fluid. And, and just to make sure, I drop a match in there. Then I create a torch. Like, have you ever done that? Like, and I know it's completely dangerous and burn the house down, but that didn't happen. So, and then one day, like, I can't figure this thing out. It's taking forever. I'm like, let's just cook them inside. And so a friend of mine says, let me help you with that. And I know all of you are thinking, are you that stupid when you got married? Yeah, listen, a different childhood. So I, a friend of mine, he says, let me help you. He, so we're going to do burgers, and he brings out the briquettes. I go, those don't work. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, and you're like, and you're preaching to us? And so he puts the lighter fluid all over the things, and he goes, let's go inside. Aren't you supposed to drop? I'm like, let's create fire. And um, and he goes, let's go inside. So we go inside. I'm like, how long are we going to be in here? Oh, 15, 20 minutes, 20. I go, what? And then you know the rest of the story. Some of you are like, no, what is it? It's like, no one's ever taught me. And <laughs> so then we go out and we light the charcoal. And all of a sudden there's this slow burn that turns into a white hot heat that can be productive. Here, here's the problem with most of us in our experience of God. We're content to build an inferno but we will not do the things that are necessary for a long, patient burn that will produce something. You follow the goofy illustration? So let me show you something about this. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. I already told you to turn there, and, uh, and, and let's see what's going on here. Luke chapter 6. Now, I'm not telling you that um, we don't want God to do you know, big, miraculous things right now. But, but let me be blunt with you. Walking with Jesus is not defined by whether or not you can say a big miracle happened today. Walking with Jesus is after years and years and years of walking with him, you turn around and say, that was a miracle. You don't change family legacies today. You change family legacies today, the next day, the next day, the next day the next day. You, you follow? Dot, 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 so to speak. That's how things change. It's sort of like if you're in marriage counseling, your marriage is on the rocks, and uh, somebody told you to have a date night, and, and so you went out one night and thought, well, I thought this changed everything. When what you've forgotten is, you know, you, you come to counseling, and one of the spouses will say, well, you know, when we were dating, and when we were first married, he or she used to pay so much attention to me, write me notes and sweet cards and letters, and they were just they just paid attention to me. And over the last few years, it seems like I'm not even in the mirror anymore. And, and so you think that you can go have a big romantic night, and that's going to change everything. The, what, what you have to do is start reengaging the process of relationship. Let me, let me show you something. I'm going to read some scripture to you, then I'm just going to give you two things to remember about this whole 
day-to-day life thing. So go to Luke chapter 6. If you read the book of Luke, if you go back and read the book of Luke, and, and you could do it in a couple of days, if not one long sitting, and you pay attention to the words of Jesus, most of your Bibles have, quote-unquote, the words of Jesus in red. If you pay attention, you'll notice a theme throughout the book of Luke. And this theme is Jesus saying, and I'm going to paraphrase it, put it in my words, he's saying, you got to go all in. This is not a uh, Patrick barbecue life. This is a Patrick friend's barbecue life where you learn it takes a long, slow burn. Let me show you. I'll show you a couple of places. Luke chapter 6, I already told you that, verse 46. So Luke 6, 46 Jesus says, so why do you call me Lord, Lord? You say, why does he repeat that like that? It's a sign of respect. Why, why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I tell you. And this is reminiscent of Dustin's message last week. Love God, obey God, experiencing God. Everyone who comes to me and hears what I'm saying, you hear my words and you do them, I'll show you what this person is like. So hearing is sort of like lighting the fire inferno. Doing is preparing and, and letting this thing happen. So the person who hears what I say say, and does these things, this is what this person's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. You can see that pretty easily. You understand building and excavating down to the hard pan or down to the rock so you can build a foundation on. And and so you kind of get that picture. So he digs down and he finds a solid place. Then he begins to build a house. And when the floods come up, i.e. life shows up, And the stream broke against that house um, and could not shake it because it had been well built. It took time. There was excavation, the foundation, brick by brick, so to speak. Now, what about the next person? Verse 49. But the one who hears and does not do them, you hear what I say, but you don't do them. You're like a person who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. This This is what I would call revival church. Experiencing God church who doesn't understand the day to day stuff. You, you're like a person who hears, but then you build on a house, build a house without a foundation. And then it says, when life shows up, when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is why people watch the church from the outside, see us get excited, know we're going to be excited for a moment, but they know it's going to go away because we're building flimsy houses without an excavated foundation. So let me show you another passage, and again, I'll, I'll wrap this together with kind of two things, and then tell you the story that happened this week. So Luke chapter 9. Go to Luke chapter 9. Just turn the page a little bit. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Find your way to verse 23. Verse 23. I'm going to read most of the paragraph, not the whole thing. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus said to everybody, If anyone would come after me, if you're going to follow me, then deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, this idea of taking up your cross, it shows up a few times in Scripture. Let me give you a way of thinking about that, because none of you parked your crosses outside, okay? It's just, um, we use a phrase around here that you're supposed to become everything God designed, called, and gifted you to be. A few weeks ago on Easter, I talked about what great value you have because you've been created by God. Jesus is talking about picking up the life you've been given, the life you've been designed, called, and gifted to be by God, and doing that. You can only live out everything you've been designed, called, and gifted by God to be when you walk with him daily. So he's saying, if you want to become everything I've designed, called, and gifted you to be, you've got to take this up and you've got to follow me. A lot of people, this whole taking up their cross thing, and this isn't really funny, although it comes across as kind of stupid funny. I mean, you hear people say, oh, I'm taking up my cross. I, every day after work, I go home, and there she is, and I'm taking up that cross, and woo-wee. And all the ladies are like, that's terrible. You say the same thing. You just don't say it out loud. Here comes my cross. He just pulled up, and he's expecting his dinner to be cooked, and I've been working all day, and blah, blah, blah. Or you think, my cross is finally about to graduate from high school, and I can ship them off, or whatever it is. Okay, We always make crosses people rather than taking up you. Okay, so then he goes on to say, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit you? Just make it personal. What does it profit you if you gain everything? You gain the whole world, but you lose or forfeit. Let me help you see it again. You lose or forfeit what God 
has designed, called, and gifted you to be. You know you can be the most financially successful person in this room and at the end of your days have missed everything you've been designed, called, and gifted to be. And you can also be the poorest person in this room and miss everything you've been designed, called, and gifted to be. Next passage, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 14, find your way to verse 25. Verse 25. A lot of people following Jesus. A lot of pe- people with uh, Weber grills and charcoal, they're ready to fire up. Verse 25. Great crowds accompanied him. And this is verse 25 of chapter 14. And Jesus said to them, kind of similar words, if, any, if anyone comes after me, now watch what he's going to say here, because this is kind of shocking. But just before, I know you've already read ahead, but understand, if you read the rest of the New Testament, you, you know what's happening here is Jesus is setting something up to, to prove a point. Because all throughout the New Testament, we're told as fathers and mothers how we're to love and respect and grow together. So understand what he's doing here, and I'll, I'll help maybe explain it a little more. He says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, Even his own life can't be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross, there it is again, and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now watch sort of the similar story. Which of you desiring to build a house doesn't first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and isn't able to finish it, everybody looks at him and laughs at him and says he began to build and he wasn't able to finish How many of you do a study and you tell everybody how excited you are about it and you're going to live the rest of your life for Jesus and then everybody waits and after about a month they laugh? Verse 31, what king going out to encounter another king in war doesn't sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet the one who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a far way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms. So therefore, any of you who doesn't renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple." Think of it this way, because these words are hard to comprehend sometimes. What Jesus is talking about is the center, so to speak, the centrism of your life. And all of us tend to be self-centric or kid-centric or career-centric, and God is on the edges. And we try to create a life around the edges rather than the center. And what he's saying is, if I am not the center of your being, if you are not Jesus-centric first, you can't follow me. And, and see, it's, I tell young couples this, I've told you this before, I always tell young couples, listen, the most important thing, men, you can do for your wives is love Jesus more than you love your wife. Ladies, the most important thing you can do is love Jesus more than you love your husband. Parents, the most important thing you can do is love Jesus more than you love your kids. The call is to be Christ-centric because that is what life spins out from. The problem with experiencing God's stuff for so many of us is we're so centered on self or others or career and we try to let Jesus kind of control the edges and be excited about the edges and nothing changes. And what Jesus is saying is you've got to get everything out of here like Eric Boyd talked about and you've got to put me right here. If you don't do this, you're going to lose sight. But you don't do this and then it's all good. It's a life. Let me show you another passage. Luke 18. Luke 18. Then I'll tell you a few things. We'll call it a morning. Luke 18. Find your way to verse 28. Remember I said if you read the book of Luke, you'll see these themes. Let me show you this one more time. Luke 18. Verse 28. Luke 18, 28. Someone asked me a question the other day. If you were a disciple, one of the apostles, which one would you be? Have you ever thought about that? Like you're like, I don't even know what those are. Um, You're like, is that the seven dwarfs? Um, So if you read the Bible, you find out. And I was like, I'd be Peter, because I'd be the one who would not do what I said I was going to do. So Luke 18, Peter said, and this is just Peter, he just thinks he's got it all figured out. Look, Jesus, we've left our homes and we've followed you. Like Jesus is going to go, oh my goodness, you're amazing, Peter. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, there's nobody who has left houses or wives or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. In other words, you can't sacrifice enough to make up for how much I'll bless you. Now, let me tell you two things about this experiencing God thing. Just two things. 
so that you'll think about it as you continue to go through this study or as you do your life. Pretty lengthy statements. I'll say them a couple of different ways. Here's the first thing, because what I'm going to refer to is what, is what it means to have an all-in experiencing God lifestyle. Not a Bible study lifestyle that's going to go away. And not a study that's focused on what the church's next big thing is. But what it is that God's calling you to. Here's the first one. An all-in, ongoing experience of God lifestyle is going to require ongoing sacrifice of the good for the better. Let me say it again. An all-in, experiencing God lifestyle will require an ongoing sacrifice of the good for the better. Let me explain that for you. In Genesis chapter 22, and men's Bible study talked about this last Wednesday, God has promised Abraham a son named Isaac. Because you know, Father Abraham has what? Many sons. Anyway, so, and Isaac is, is one of these sons, the son of promise. And because of this promise, Abraham is so thankful. Then God shows up one night and he says, Hey, Abe, um, I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. Now, what's interesting is you don't read this in Genesis, but you jump to Hebrews. And the Bible tells us that Abraham was willing to offer Isaac because he believed that God could raise him from the dead. And Isaac was already a teenager by this time. So over a span of many years, Abraham's walk with God had brought him to a point where he's willing to sacrifice the good of God's blessing in return for perhaps an even better blessing. And eventually what God did was, because of the obedience, showed him a ram caught in the bushes. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Some of you have been blessed by God, but haven't learned to be content with what God's blessed you with. You're not willing to sacrifice the good for the even better spiritual blessing. We don't say no to ourselves. Some of us are so kid-centric, we don't even know what it is to put Jesus in the center of our lives because we're so kid-focused. And yet what happens and what you'll discover is as you walk with Jesus and the more you walk with him day by day, the greater the blessings will be. And the crazy thing is you'll be willing to sacrifice these blessings because you know you could never sacrifice enough that God will not outbless you with something else. And I'm not talking about just monetary stuff. That's immature televangelist Christianity. I'm talking about a walk that you eventually come to this place where you realize the richer blessings are what God does in your soul rather than what he does in your pocketbook in your home and even your physical health. And you have to realize that this day-to-day walk with Jesus is this place where you begin to see the blessings around you even in the trials and the tests and you surrender that to him because he's going to work in you just a little bit more. And just a little bit more. Let me take you to the second thing, because it's actually, I think, the more important thing. And that is that this all-in, ongoing experience of God lifestyle, I've already told you that phrase, all-in, ongoing experience of God lifestyle, outlives a 12-chapter, 12-week study. It's going to require ongoing excavation. Let me give you a couple of words. Excavation, examination, and foundation building. Let me say that again. This all-in, experiencing God lifestyle requires a practice, a habit of ongoing excavation and foundation building in our lives. Remember when Dustin, if you were here last week, you saw him do this. If you weren't here, I hope you'll go watch the podcast. He showed us near the end when he pulled out his shoes and his wife's shoes. And, And he said, whose footsteps are you following? Whose trail are you following? And what footprints are you leaving behind? It's a beautiful example because my my life has to consist in a disciplined step, one step after another after another, so somebody can walk in my footprints. But we've also told you about how this walk with Jesus of experiencing God is made up of one brick after another brick after another brick. Go back to the first passage I read you where you excavate and you get down to the foundation, then you start building. Many of us want God to show us the mansion of his blessing, then we'll go all in. Rather than trusting the designer who says, work on this brick, and then I'll give you the next one, and the next one, and then one day, you'll step back and realize, huh, that's quite a house God allowed me to be part of. 
But that requires an all-in, sometimes digging in, digging deeper. And by the way, the longer you walk with Jesus, sometimes the deeper he digs in our lives to see if we'll trust him. But let me try to give you another example, because I think you understand what I'm saying, but you know, we say there's no neutral moments, and this has been so true in preparing for messages over the last few weeks. So I'll tell you this story, then we'll wrap it up. And, you know, in Odessa and here at the end of the services, you know, we love for you to come forward for prayer or go to the prayer areas, whatever, because I'm going to end this and we'll be dismissed. So this week, a baseball player comes to see me for counsel. I'm not going to tell you who or where from, okay? And, um, you know, because I'm the preacher, I have magic answers. I can answer them, fix everything, just boom, done. And so... Um, that's not true. Um, occasionally. So anyways, baseball player comes to see me about a life issue, okay? And um, so we sit down and we're, you know, jabbering, you know, small talking, blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, and I'm asking about baseball and, and uh, he starts to share with me that he'd recently been in a, a hitting slump. Now, I know some of you have already turned me off because this is an athletic thing. This is a baseball thing. You need to wake up, okay? So I don't have a good cross-stitch illustration. So he, um, some of you are still thinking you're going to teach me how to barbecue. I, no, don't. So anyways, we're talking, and he's telling me he was batting under 100. Now, if you know anything about baseball, that means you stink, okay? That's, that's what that means. That means you're not playing, okay? You follow? Okay, so, but you know, in baseball, if you're good 30% of the time, you're world class. And, and so he starts to tell me that now he's batting over 400, okay? Now, I know he's coming to talk to me about this issue over here, all right? But we're small talking about the issues that matter, baseball. Okay, you see what I'm talking about? We're going to get to his life later. So we're talking about baseball. It was a joke. So anyways, we're talking about that. And I go, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. I said, before we move on to your life, because I already, I already know what I'm going to tell him about his life, okay? And um, not because I haven't heard him, but I already know what he's going to talk about. So I said, time out just a minute. I said, when you turn this whole hitting thing around, did you just one day wake up and go, I'm on, man. I'm turning this thing around today. And poof, it happened. He goes, oh, no, no, no. You know, I'm playing dumb. Really? What would you do? And, and so I said, I said, let me ask you a question. Over the time of turning this thing around, did you go to the batting cages? Oh, you can't. I've lost count how many hours I spent in the batting cages. I go, okay, good. I go, did you work on a tee? Like a, I, I know some of you think you only do that in tee ball, but major league players are using tee. They're hitting off a tee all the time. He goes, oh, I, I worked off a tee consistently. And he, fa- he said, in fact, I had to change the angle of my, I don't know what, the, the launch angle of my hitting. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, and then I said, did you do soft toss? And some of you don't know what that is. It's where a sucker sits behind a gauge and, and throws balls at you and you hit them at him as hard as you can and hope that cage stays together. And so, oh yeah, I did that all the time. And, and so I'm going through all these exercises and these, I'm doing mental exercises and I'm doing all these things. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And gradually, next thing you know, bam, I'm on top of the league. I go, huh. I go, do you know what I'm getting ready to tell you about your issue? He said, what? And I said, my first question to you about your issue in life is I'm going to ask you. And I, just, I go, what do you think I'm going to ask you about your life and walking with Jesus right now? He said, you're going to ask me if I'm reading my Bible. You're going to ask me if I'm praying. You're going to ask me if I'm serving. You're going to ask me if I'm sacrificing. You're going to ask me if I'm giving. You're going to ask me if I'm doing all the basics. Brick by brick, moment by moment, swing by swing. I said, exactly. Pay me. No, I didn't say that. So, uh, anyways. um, Actually, he said, should I pay you for this? So, um. Anyways, it's a stupid illustration, but see, it's exactly what goes on in our lives. We want to have home runs with Jesus, to use the illustration as corny as I possibly can. We want experiencing God to be the home run that absolutely sets us free, that absolutely turns our lives around. And the fact of the matter is, it ain't going to happen unless you keep going to the cages You keep working off a tee. And what's so amazing about this illustration is the world's best have to keep working on the basics. And then occasionally in life it shows up in a home run or over 400 hitting. The problem for the vast majority of us in this room is we want Jesus to do something before we listen 
and obey and do. You follow? Save me from this addiction. Well, will you pray and seek the Lord and do what he says and listen to advice and obey counsel? Lord, help me to do this. Lord, help me to do this. Hey, I need an experience. I need flames from heaven. I've got the lighter fluid. I'm ready to go. And he says, this might take 10 years. Day by day, off the tee, soft toss, in the cage, listening to coaches, reading the Bible, time in prayer, faithfulness to serve, giving your life away. If it sounds monotonous, it is monotonous because one day you turn around and say, wow, after this many decades, that was a miracle. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the day. I pray that you would teach each one of us what it means for us to experience God moment by moment, day by day, pitch by pitch, barbecue pit by barbecue pit, friend by friend, every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week, and God bless you.